Well, when our four boys were growing up, uh, we read them books at bedtime almost every night. And we had all the classics, books like Good Night Moon. How many of you had that book with your kids growing up? Books like Guess How Much I Love You. Anybody have that one? The Rabbits. And we had another book called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Anyone have that one? Well, the story of Alexander is the story of a little boy who, whose day starts off bad and then it gets worse. And I want to I read part of it to you here today. So I want you to imagine it's bedtime. You're getting really nice and comfortable. Here it goes. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard and by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running and I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At breakfast, Anthony found a Corvette Stingray in his car, and a car kit in his breakfast cereal box. And Nick found a junior undercover agent code ring in his breakfast cereal box. But in my breakfast cereal box, all I found was breakfast cereal. I think I'll move to Australia. And then he goes to school, and his best friend demotes him to third best friend. And after school, he and his two brothers go to the dentist, and he's the only one who has a cavity. He gets home, and they have lima beans for dinner. For me, that would be Brussels sprouts. I think I can make an argument that Brussels sprouts are evil, actually. <laughs> and then he lays in bed that night and he says, it's been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. My mom says some days are like that, even in Australia. Now, I have two responses to that little book. One is, why do we read books like this to our children? <laughs> Shouldn't we read them happy books? My second response is, we must read books like this to our children, right? Because life will have its terrible, horrible, no good, very bad moments, and we'll want to go to Australia. As Gretchen said, we're in the second week of a series from the Old Testament book of Ruth. And this beautiful, strange little story is like an oasis of hope sandwiched between the chaotic and violent period of the judges. If you ever tried to read that part of your Bible, you know what I'm talking about. And then the somewhat disappointing era of the kings, as that happens just after the book of Ruth. Uh, it's a story of tragedy and loss, a story of rescue and redemption. It's really a love story. And it's a love story tucked inside the greater love story of the entire Bible. And it's a pivotal moment, a key moment in the salvation history of the whole world. But we're not quite there yet. We can't see it quite yet with where we are in the story. Here's what's happened so far. We know that God had given his people... A promise, the promised land, the place of his presence and blessing. And then the story of Ruth begins with a famine in that promised land in Israel. A man named Elimelech chooses to take his family, his wife Naomi and their two sons, not to Australia, but to a place called Moab. Now remember that Moab and the Moabites were a people group considered to be hostile toward Israel and the Israelites, and they were strangers to the God of Israel Jehovah, Yahweh, who we just sang about. Now, for us today, Moab, I think, is a little bit more of a spiritual place. It's that place that looks good, but really is not good for us. So once in Moab, we read that things go from bad to worse. The sons marry Moabite women, foreigners. One of them is named Ruth. Then Elimelech dies, both sons die, and Naomi is left devastated. Then Naomi hears that God visits his people, the famine ends, so she decides to go back after 10 years. Ruth Ruth then makes the shocking decision to go with Naomi, to leave her land and go with Naomi back to Israel. Now, this is the first hint we have in chapter 1, last week uh, when you were here, the first hint that God is up to something special in this young woman, Ruth. Now, up to this point in the story, at the end of chapter 1, almost nothing good has happened. It's been terrible, horrible, no good, and very bad. Not for a day, but for an entire decade. Then right at the end of chapter 1, we read this verse, Ruth 1, verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. That's the next hint that God is up to something special, something that Naomi can't quite see yet. Now we pick up today in chapter 2, and I'm going to read this first 13 verses, pausing here and there to point out things that we might miss that are historical and cultural in the story. So Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. 
Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. I'm going to stop there and ask a question. If you're paying attention, this should, this should uh, be a question that pops up in your mind as well. Why are we just now, beginning of chapter 2, after all this drama, why are we just now hearing about this guy, Boaz? The writer's telling us that Naomi has a relative on her husband's side who is, in this translation, a worthy man. Now, that phrase doesn't really do justice to the Hebrew words here. There are two words used to describe Boaz, or this man that we, that's related to Elimelech. And he, one word is, means warrior or champion. The other one means great or wealthy. Various translations of the Bible in English say he's a man of standing, a wealthy and influential man, a mighty man of wealth, okay? So we're told that this mighty man of wealth is a relative of Naomi's late husband, Elimelech. Now, in that culture, family was everything. And in the case of loss or tragedy, family, even extended family, were expected to step in and help. It was a cultural thing. And we learned in chapter 1 that Elimelech died shortly after going to Moab, and then 10 years go by, a decade, and in all that time, why doesn't Naomi even once say, hey, you know, I remembered, I have this relative back home, a great and wealthy man of noble character, surely he will offer us help. He'll be obligated as family. But she doesn't. I was thinking about this. What could possibly keep Naomi from going to Boaz for help? Fear? Maybe fear of being rejected? Maybe shame? You know, going to Moab for an Israelite and then coming back would have been cause for shame because they'd left, would have been seen as desertion, abandonment of their people. Maybe she was ashamed. Maybe pride. Naomi at one time in her life was a wealthy woman. Maybe she was too prideful to ask for help. We can't know for sure, because the story doesn't tell us, but I think some of those things can still keep us from God today. Fear, shame, and pride. So this mention of Boaz actually is the first time the storyteller brings him into the story is a sort of a hint, like in a movie when you see a hint, oh, pay attention, this guy's going to be important. Verse 2, and Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. Now, I want to stop here again. There's a couple things. First, Ruth and Naomi have both experienced tremendous loss. They both lost everything. And they respond to their situation in very different ways. Naomi is kind of resigned to her fate. Back in chapter 1, she says, don't call me Naomi any longer. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. So Naomi is carrying with her a heart that's full of pain, full of bitterness and hopelessness. And I think I can make a guess that there are at least a few of us in this room who have been through seasons of life that feel a little bit like that. We've had terrible, horrible no good, very bad moments or seasons, and our hearts are filled with pain, sometimes bitterness, so much so that sometimes we can stop hoping, stop praying, stop trusting, assume that God has sort of forgotten about us. But Ruth, Ruth is completely different. In the midst of her loss, she makes this dramatic statement of faith and hope. She says to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And here she takes initiative to search out favor, to seek favor. And secondly, we need to understand this ancient gleaning law. What was that about? Way back in the book of Leviticus, Chapter 23, God says to his people, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. So the gleaning law was sort of an ancient welfare system. Those who owned fields were wealthy enough to own fields. When they harvested, they were not to harvest the corners and edges of their field. They were to leave those for the poor and needy. And if their workers dropped some of their produce, like they were carting off some grapes and a bunch dropped on the ground, they weren't supposed to pick it up. They were supposed to leave it there so those who were poor could come along and pick it up. It was their way to survive. 
Verse 3, so she set out, this is Ruth, and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the clan of the clan of Elimelech. There's this guy again. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, pay attention to that, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Now to hear the author's telling us something about the character of this man, Boaz. Just introduced us to him, and already we see he's a man of faith, a man of character, a man who honors the God of Israel. Verse 5, then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? That's a curious way to say that, isn't it? It sounds kind of like, oh, whose car is this? Sounds kind of like ownership. And in that culture at that time, that's kind of the way it was. Women or wives were sort of seen as property. We'll hear more about that in just a minute. Verse 6, and the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter. That's the way in that culture an older man would speak to a younger woman. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Now, we won't notice this, but this would be highly unusual in this culture. In that culture at that time, the women drew water for the men. And foreign women would have drawn water for the Israelites. This is a foreign woman who's being invited to drink from the very water that the men are drinking from. Very, very unusual. Verse 10. Then she fell on her face bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Now, three things we're going to look at today. First, the search for God's favor, then the person of God's favor, and finally, taking refuge in God's favor. So first, taking ref uh, the, the search for God's favor. I shared parts of this story before, but in the very early days of our courtship, of my courtship with my wife, um, I was most definitely the pursuer, and she was the pursuee. Um, I, I had noticed her, uh, but she had not noticed me, at least not in that way. So I decided if I wanted to get her attention, to win her favor, uh, I needed a strategy. Now, every guy in the room, you guys all know this, right? You know you need a strategy at that moment. Young guys, you need a strategy. And so I decided that my strategy would be omnipresence. <laughs> yeah, omnipresence. So I memorized her daily schedule. Uh, and when she went to class, I was there. And when she went to chapel, I was there. When she went to lunch, I was there. Wherever she went, I found a way to be there. Now, I, that would be called stalking today, I, I realize. <laughs> but the search for favor meant I had to be in the right place. So we see in the story, Ruth chapter 2 begins, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. Now, Naomi and Ruth have returned to Israel, but have nothing. At the minimum, uh, they need food to survive. So Ruth steps up and asks permission to go out and find favor. Find favor with anyone who will let her glean. And now, the word favor here is a really interesting word in the Hebrew. It's the word, I don't know how you actually pronounce it, but Cain. It can also be translated as grace, but, but it's a very rich and nuanced word. It, it ca carries the sense of both provision and protection. It's a person of lesser standing receiving the benefits, the provision, and the protection of a person of greater standing. Verse 6, and, the, and the, 
No, excuse me, hang on a second, make sure I'm in the right place. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. So Ruth is searching. She's actively pursuing God's favor because that means survival. They need to eat. And to receive God's favor, she has to be in the place of God's favor. So she's willing to do whatever it takes. Now remember, Elimelech and his family had left Israel and gone to Moab. They had left the place of God's favor and blessing and promise and gone away from it. And now Naomi and Ruth return to the place of God's favor. This is a step of faith. In fact, there's a hint of what the Bible calls repentance here. Repentance is a turning back, a returning. We see this in, for example, Jesus' story of the prodigal son. The young man in his rebellion leaves his father with his inheritance and goes to the far country. And then only when he comes to his senses does he turn and return back to the home of his father. Now next, Ruth asks to glean in a field. Now this is the humblest of positions. She's a widow, she's a foreigner, completely dependent on the favor, the grace, the provision of another, one who is greater than she. This is also a step of faith. And then we see she finds herself in a field that belongs to this man, Boaz, who turns out to be the person of God's favor. This is the second point today, the person of God's favor. I wonder um, if there's anybody in the room today that happens to be related to a very famous person. For example, anybody here related anywhere in your family tree to uh, a U.S. president? Really? Okay, we've got a couple. Vice president, anybody? Governor? Mayor? Dog catcher? <laughs> How about a movie star? Someone been on Jeopardy, maybe? <laughs> How about an athletic uh, sports hero, okay? Well, when my grandmother on my mother's side passed away, I was just 10 years old. Uh, our whole family traveled down to Virgie, Kentucky, uh, in the hills of eastern Kentucky, where my mom grew up. Uh, for my grandmother's funeral. It was my first experience of a funeral, as often um, it is for a young person when, you, when a grandparent passes away. And I remember being more fascinated by the whole thing than, than sad, although I clearly could see my mother's grief. But right before that funeral started, uh, when family and friends were gathering, probably for the visitation time, uh, my uncle Butch, who was my mom's youngest brother, probably in his mid-20s at that time, sort of sidled up to me. Now, this is his mother's funeral. But he sidles up to me, and he says to me, um, he, he was sort of mischievous as, a, as an uncle, a twinkle in his eye, and he knew that, he, that I loved baseball, even at 10 as a boy. So he sidles up to me, and he says, hey, did you know that our family is related to Casey Stengel? I assume you guys know who Casey Stengel is, right? He was the famous manager of the New York Yankees, went to the Hall of Fame and all that. I, and I was 10, and I knew who he was. And I said, no. Uh, he said, yeah, uh, look at the front of the room. Look up there. And there was a line of people walking by my grandmother's uh, casket. And he said, see that guy up there? That's your great uncle, Casey Stengel. I looked up, and sure enough, there was a, an older man, craggy face. And if I imagined him in a baseball uniform, it was, it was him. I was related to Casey Stengel. And he said, go ahead, go ahead, go up, go up there. He'd love to meet you. Go up and say hi to him. <laughs> this is his own mother's funeral. He, he said, go on, go on. He'd love to meet you. And I, I started to picture myself sitting with my new uncle Casey and him telling me stories about Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle and all my heroes. And just as I was getting up the courage to walk up there to the front of the room, he goes, ha, nah, 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 I'm just kidding you. That's your great uncle Plez, your grandfather's brother. And there went my brush with fame, just like that. <laughs> Verse 4 says, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, pay attention, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? Now, why would Boaz, this great man of wealth, notice this young woman in his field? Now, maybe he knew all the locals who were, usually, who were poor and usually gleaning behind his workers. Maybe he knew them, and this was a new one. Maybe she stood out as being way too young to be a widow in this situation. Maybe she stood out because of her beauty. We don't really know. But we do know that he would understand that anyone of her age, any woman of her age that was in his field gleaning had to have had something really bad 
happened in her life because she had no other options. It says, and the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back from Naomi with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. There's a little more interesting detail here. Some scholars think this means that Ruth asked for a little more than she was supposed to. Um, that she asked not only to glean, which is pick up the scraps, but to gather among the sheaves. That is to also gather from among the stalks that have already been bundled. Some scholars think maybe it's because she didn't really know the rules of Israel. Some think she knew that she needed more because she was also gleaning for Naomi, who was back home. But at any rate, the overseer here seems like he needs to, un he needs to explain. So Boaz said, who's that woman and what's she doing? And he says, well, well, she came and she has continued from early morning till now, except for a short rest. Can't get rid of her. She's just working. <laughs> then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Ruth searches for favor, and she finds it not just in the field, notice, but in a person, in Boaz. Boaz offers provision. He allows her to glean. He offers more than that. He allows her to also gather among the sheaves. Even more than that, he allows her to drink water that the men have drawn for themselves. And on top of all that, he offers protection. Verse 9, let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? Now, this is a little bit disturbing if we're paying attention. The only reason Boaz would say something like this is that evidently, in that day and that time, women in Ruth's position, widows, forced to glean, were at great risk of being assaulted. They had no husbands to protect them. They were at great risk. They had no one to defend them, no place of safety or refuge. This would have been especially true for a young foreign woman who was also a widow. And the author repeatedly refers to Ruth as the Moabite woman. He wants us to know this was a Moabite. She didn't belong there. But Boaz, who is a great and godly man, offers Ruth the favor of his protection. He says, don't go to any other field. Because he knew his field was the only place he could offer her complete protection. I read one um, commenter who said this is the first no sexual harassment policy in the workplace in the history of humankind. <laughs> and when you are thirsty, he says, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? So what do we know about Boaz at this point? We know he's worthy, he's mighty, he's wealthy, He's got tremendous resources. He offers favor, provision, and protection to a foreigner, to a woman with no rights. He offers far more than the law has required, even offers her water. And he came from Bethlehem. Does that remind you of anyone? It should be reminding you of the one who offered living water to a Samaritan woman, a foreigner, at the well. In the New Testament, one who offered grace to a woman dragged before him, caught in the act of adultery, one born in Bethlehem. Boaz is a picture of the person of God's favor. We're going to see much more about that in the next couple of weeks. And thirdly, that leads us to taking refuge in God's favor. You have the place of God's favor, searching for God's favor. You have the person of God's favor, and now taking refuge in God's favor. Verse 11, but Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Now here we find out Boaz knows all about the story of Ruth and Naomi, their situation. And he makes what would have been a startling statement in that culture at the time. He says, the Lord repay you for what you've done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel. Where is Ruth from? Moab. The God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now he's speaking to a foreigner, a Moabite woman. He's inviting her to find refuge under the wings of the God of Israel. Now, throughout the Old Testament, you point to many places where God 
Yahweh, Jehovah, is referred to as a picture as a great eagle under whose wings his people can find protection and salvation. Psalm 57 is an example. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. To, to find refuge is to find a place of safety, a place of protection, a place of complete trust. It's, it's an image, a word picture of salvation offered by God. Now, the Hebrew word translated wings, uh, kanaf, can also mean sort of the edges, the corners, the fringes of a garment. And the Jewish people have, have a garment that, th that they wear that has a fringe like that to remind them of the wings of God. We actually see this in a beautiful story in Luke chapter 8 when he tells the story of a woman who's suffering from a painful and humiliating medical condition called an issue of blood. Uh, and she would, which would have rendered her unclean and according to Jewish uh, ceremonial law. She would not have been able to go into the temple, would not have been able to offer sacrifices. She was an outcast, even to her own family. But Jesus is coming through her town. She makes her way to him, fights her way through a crowd, and then in desperation and hope and faith, she reaches out and grabs, remember she grabs just the fringe of his garment, his wings. And Jesus senses him touch her, and then he says to her, daughter, Daughter, your faith has made you well because she entrusted herself under the wings of his protection. So where are we in this little story? Began with famine, a bad thing. Sojourn in Moab, a place far from the place of blessing, far from God, and then things go from bad to worse. Naomi then hears God has visited his people and the famine is over. So we first get this sense God is up to something. And then she decides to return home, but her heart is bitter and empty. But Ruth then chooses to stay with her. We see God is up to something. They return to Bethlehem as the barley harvest is just beginning. God is up to something. Ruth decides to seek favor and, and to glean in a field. T turns out not to just be any field, but the field of Boaz, who is their relative. God is up to something. Boaz provides the favor of food and protection. But even all of this is just a hint, just a hint so far of what God is going to do. A full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So where are you in your story, I wonder? Have you been to Moab? Have you been to Moab? Some of, some of you are home from college. College got over, graduations, you're home from college. College is a great place to be, great place of growth, but it can be Moab. It can be far from God in many ways. Or maybe you've just been through a season of, of loss or pain, and the bitterness and pain you felt has led you into sort of a desolate place. Have you drifted far from the place of God's favor? Have you had a terrible, horrible, very bad day or year or decade? Well, this story tells us that God is up to something. And God is up to something in your life because he knows where you are. He knows where you are. He understands where you are. And he wants much more for you and for me than Moab. He wants much, much more. And so he says, turn around. Turn, return. Come back to the place of my favor. Come back to the person of my favor. For there you will always find refuge. Let's bow in prayer before we come to the Lord's table. Lord God, we thank you today for your word, for this ancient, beautiful story of pain and loss and of provision and pr protection. And in a way, we're all like Naomi, meaning we've been to Moab. We know what that's like, to be lost and far away and maybe bitter of heart. But you know us you love us and you want more for us than that. And so as we come to your table today, remind us again of your provision for us. Through bread and cup, remind us of your body and your blood given that we might know the promise of your refuge and your salvation. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Just before we pass the elements, we remind you that this table does not belong to Chapel Street.
belongs to the Lord. So if you're here today, even for the first time, you put your faith in Jesus as your forgiver, your savior, you're welcome to share with us. As they pass the trays out, there are two cups stacked together in each spot. Take both cups, hold them till all have received, and I will lead us through the remembrance of bread and cup. <laughs> 